The German army had come up with what was probably the best aircraft of the war, the Fokker D7. It had a powerful Mercedes engine, two machine guns. Unlike most fighters, the wings were cantilevered, which means self-supporting, and they didn't need a lot of wires to hold them together. The fast and agile Fokker D7, more than any other plane, demonstrated the tactical possibilities of planes as offensive weapons. Within the world of flying aces, it loomed large. But within the context of the entire war, it was not decisive. At the end of the First World War, the airplane's greatest contribution remained reconnaissance. Probably the most significant use of aerial reconnaissance in the war was in 1918 on the Allies' side. General Ludendorff launched the last German offensive, and it nearly succeeded. He was trying to win the war quickly before Americans got into the field in great numbers. Aerial reconnaissance let the Allies know what was going on, so they were able to attack where Germans had a weakness. The camera was the only strategic piece of equipment on a World War I airplane. But it would take the more sophisticated planes of World War II for aircraft to play a bigger offensive role, controlling airspace and engaging in bombing raids against supplies and civilians. Few airplanes had radios during the First World War. The radio's bulky size and its inability to transmit extended range voice signals made it impractical. World War I tech will return on Modern Marvels. Despite cutting edge machinery like airplanes and tanks, the weapons of the trenches were guns, artillery, and a host of small bombs. The machine gun was the most effective of all. The machine gun, as with so many weapons used in World War I, was an American invention. The first effective automatic machine gun was the Maxim, which was designed by an American. Irish immigrant and amateur inventor Hiram Maxim was reportedly moved to invent the machine gun in 1885 after someone told him, if you want to make a lot of money, invent something that will enable these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. Maxim achieved his machine gun's rapid fire ability using the thrust of the recoil to quickly pull the next bullet into the chamber. He had limited success selling it to the American army, so he went to Europe and sold it to just about every country over there. So many of the combatants were using Maxim guns or guns designed based on the Maxim. Another method of rapid fire was developed that collected the expanding gases expelled when the gun was fired to trigger a mechanism that allowed accelerated shooting. The best machine guns had a range of about 4,000 yards, with an aimed range of 1,000 yards, shooting rifle caliber bullets. The battlefield is going to become dominated by a recoil-operated machine gun, which can spew out 400 to 500 rounds a minute. Not only that, but it has a water jacket on it, which keeps the barrel cool. So you can fire this thing and fire it and fire it and fire it and keep on firing it. Almost as important as the gun's ability to fire rapidly was its ability to pivot. Guns were placed on a special mount called a traversing and elevation mechanism that enabled each gunner to spray rounds in an arc. By swiveling, you could cover 500 yards of battlefront with one machine gun. And if you could shoot out to 400 yards and men were walking across 400 yards, you could pretty much kill them all with one machine gun before they get anywhere near you. A typical heavy machine gun weighed about 50 pounds, with the mount adding another 70 pounds or so. It was not designed to be portable. It was designed to stay in the trenches. This is a very solid mount, so it's not like it's bucking around a lot when you're firing. The crew is about six people. You uh, have ammo bearers. You have four people to carry the mount. There's people to keep water in the water jacket to keep it from overheating. And you have people who continually feed ammunition into these. Lighter portable machine guns were developed around 1915. They still weighed around 30 pounds, with their mounts adding another 20 pounds. A typical example is the French Hotchkiss. You can fire this thing practically forever. Even though it's not water-cooled, it will get very hot. But these large fins here, which are basically the feature of the Hotchkiss machine gun, puts enough area out that this thing will get red, guarantee you. 
but it will continue to shoot. By far the least effective machine gun was the French-designed, lightweight, air-cooled Chocha. And when you're trying to fire it, with this long recoil, it just shakes itself. There is aluminum around the barrel to help, help in the air cooling. They figured the air holes would help pass air down it. But all it ends up doing is jamming the weapon by getting more dirt in there. Because the magazines are so curved and open, you get dirt and everything else inside here. Most people considered them the weapon from hell. Despite technological failures like the Shosha, the guns were killing machines. Old school generals ordered their soldiers to charge, only to have the men mowed down. In virtually every battle of World War I, the machine gun played a decisive role. It was particularly decisive in the early British offensives. In the Somme, for instance, this is where thousands and thousands of British soldiers were killed daily for six months. And they were just charging machine guns and being mowed down because the British generals didn't have a better idea. Uh, as Winston Churchill uh, said, there was something illogical about trying to attack machine guns with the chests of soldiers. As devastating as the machine gun was, large caliber guns, collectively known as artillery, were even more destructive, wreaking havoc with explosions that threw men and machinery into the air. Artillery weapons can be divided into three types. The first is a gun that shoots line of sight. The shell is fairly heavy, so the explosive power that shoots it out must be strong. Howitzers shoot at a high angle, and they generally don't shoot as far. The explosive force launching the shell is lighter. Therefore, the actual shell itself can have a thinner wall with more explosives and can do more damage. Mortars are like small howitzers that shoot up at an angle with shells that come down almost vertically. They tend to carry considerable explosive power for their size. Even before the trenches were dug, artillery was pummeling defensive structures along the Belgian border. Belgium hoped to rely on a group of fortresses to prevent the Germans from invading. But Germany had developed massive guns, nicknamed Big Berthas, which were some of the largest caliber artillery pieces built during the war. Some of these explosive packed shells weighed over 2,000 pounds. And some of these guns were so massive that they could only be transported in pieces by rail car. Belgium's fortresses fell within an afternoon. These big guns literally smashed those fortresses flat, which allowed the, the German army to go through Belgium. And no one had ever seen modern fortifications smashed up like that. Though of smaller caliber than the Big Berthas, the most technologically innovative of all the siege mortars was the Paris gun, built to terrify Parisian civilians into surrendering. The 210 millimeter gun's 131 foot long steel barrel could hurl shells over 10 miles high into the stratosphere, and the gun could be fired from over 75 miles away. The French didn't know what they were being hit with. They thought they were being bombed by a Zeppelin or a gas works had blown up or something like that. Then once they, they found out that these explosions were occurring in sort of a straight line, now it was a gun. More than 256 Parisians were killed in a barrage that lasted for six months and dropped 351 shells. But the Paris gun was too unwieldy to sustain a consistent barrage. The barrel needed constant replacement, and it was impossible to target accurately. In the end, it cost Germany manpower and resources that it couldn't spare. Trench mortars, however, were particularly effective along the front. They were essentially just a strong tube in which an explosive shell was inserted. Braced against the ground, they needed no recoil-absorbing mechanism. Mortars like the Stokes 3-inch and the Newton 6-inch threw explosive shells, gas shells, flares, or even shrapnel up into the air to drop nearly vertically and unobstructed into an enemy trench. The key is that trench mortars were ones that were small enough to be moved into the trenches. And they had a short range, five, 800 yards, but enough to hit the trench on the other side. And there was really no defense against them. The only defense was to dig a hole and hope that they didn't drop a shell right in. Coordinated with machine guns, trench mortars were lethally effective. 
machine gun spray could hurt.